Hello, everyone. My name is Linda Abriola, and I'm going to talk to you today about some work that we're doing in modeling a new class of contaminants and their behavior in the subsurface. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person, but I hope you will send me uh, questions and I'd be happy to answer them after the talk. So um, let's get started. Um, I wanna to talk to you today about compounds that are emerging as contaminants in the US and across the globe in industrialized nations and they're um, turning up in our rainwater everywhere. And they're called um, informally forever chemicals. These are substances that are um, distinguished by strong chlorine, excuse me, carbon fluorine bonds that are very, very resistant to any kind of degradation, whether chemical, biological, or thermal. They're called per and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS. And it's a class of compounds that has up to about 5,000 different um, compounds within this class. So they're in many commercial products, they're surface active, they accumulate at interfaces. Um, in the kinds of products that you might find these chemicals include um, water repellents, uh, Gore-Tex, Scotchgard, uh, nonstick surfaces for nonstick pans or for uh, coating uh, food packaging, uh, a waterproof cosmetics, and um, perhaps most importantly in the US, they're components of aqueous film forming foams, which are used in firefighting. And um, they have been used um, since the 1970s for this purpose. Because these are very, very uh, resistant to chemical degradation, they tend to accumulate in our bodies. And there's a huge number of sites in the US that have been uncovered now that have contamination. This is um, <clears throat> dates back to June 8th. And, you, and this keeps growing as time goes on. You can see that military sites are any place there was base, a base and they had fire training has contamination with PFAS chemicals. We also see it showing up in water supplies. And then when you look at where these chemicals are used, whether it, and, and they're landfilled, it's likely that this map is gonna to continue to grow with dots as over time. <clears throat> it's showing up in our blood serum, in our bloodstream, and it's starting to be clear that it's, it's um, <clears throat> causing a number of potential health problems, particularly affecting young young infants and young um, and fetal growth and immune response, and it, it accumulates in mother's breast milk. So this has a long half life in the body, and it even at very very low concentrations, they're starting to see health effects. And so in some states, in uh, for instance Massachusetts in the U.S they are starting to um, regulate these compounds to the parts per trillion level, which is extremely low. Um, so these are very, very um, of, of great concern in the US and they're starting to fund a lot of research in this area. And so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing. Um, it's a collaborative study and we're doing experiments and modeling. My um, contribution is the modeling work uh, I work very closely with Professor Kurt, Kurt Pinnell at Brown University. Much of the modeling you'll see presented here was done by Masood Arshardi, who uh, was at Tufts as a research assistant professor and has just joined Gradient. And um, Chuchi Lau and Chen Lu did the um, batch studies and the column work that you'll see here. So um, our goal are to improve our understanding of how these contaminants move in the subsurface and persist. And we're particularly focused on these firefighting training, firefighting and fire training areas, which are of great concern to the US government. Uh, our funder is CERDIP. Um, and then once we understand these processes, then we're trying to develop and validate mathematical models that can describe the transport and retention of these contaminants. So we can use them for site assessment and for future planning, and uh, hopefully to design some remediation methods to at least <clears throat> keep these from migrating further in the environment. So the way we approach this is we integrate experiments and modeling. We do small scale tests to measure interfacial properties and absorption behavior. We um, 
incorporate the parameters that we measure into mathematical models, and then we test those models to see if we can predict the transport in packed columns in the laboratory. And then once we have some confidence in our models, we can use them to upscale to predictions at the field scale. So I'm going to show you just briefly a few examples of each of these to give you a flavor for the kinds of work that we're doing. So we're studying a number of different interfaces. We're studying air-water interfaces, but we're also studying organic liquid water interfaces because when they uh, do fire training, typically they'll, they'll toss uh, oils or spent solvents onto the ground, set them on fire, and then douse them with these AFFF formulations. So you get a mixture of contaminants in the subsurface. Um, we're going to only focus on a few of these PFAS compounds. I told you there are five, there's thousands of them, but the, some of the ones that are predominantly in these AFFF formulations are PFOA and PFOS. Um, we're all, I'm also going to show you some results from a few uh, other mixtures as well. So if you look to the right here, what you see is that we have um, a plot of surface tension versus the log of PFOS concentration. And as we increase the PFOS concentration, there, we see a surface tension reduction because the PFOS wants to go to the interface. And as you increase salt content from pure millicule water, mi millicule water all the way down to much more um, unpleasant drinking water, you can see that the surface tension also decreases. So if we now take that surface tension measurement and we fit a curve to it, and use Gibbs equation, use the thermodynamics, we assume that the interfacial tension is a measure of the surface concentration. And what we're trying to do is predict how much of that mass of the PFAS is going to the surface. So we fit the Sysoskowski equation, which fits these data very well. We plug those into the Gibbs equation and we estimate the surface accumulation. And the re end result is something called the langmuir sysoskowski equation. And it's Langmuir because it reaches a plateau. So as you increase the PFOS concentration, eventually the surface gets saturated, let's say, and you don't get any more surface accumulation. And again, you see this effect of total dissolved solids. And as the total dissolved solids increase, you see an increase in the surface accumulation. So that's the way we try to model the retention at the interface. Um, I also wanted to show you what happens when you have a mixture. This is AFFF versus PFOS. So PFOS is the, uh, has the highest percentage of um, concentration in AFFF. It's, it, it's uh, concentrated to about 100, um, I, actually it's 150 milligrams per liter. I don't have the conversion in my head with a uh, molar here. But um, what you see here is that you increase the tr concentration of AFFF in solution you can see that um, it again, this interfacial tension is reduced. And if you get to the concentration, which is the concentration that they actually apply in fire training, you see it's a tremendous interfacial re tension reduction. Whereas for PFOS at that same concentration that's in AFFF, you don't see as much interfacial re tension reduction. So what's happening in these mixtures is there are other compounds that are also surface active and are reducing interfacial tension. So um, now I want to move on and talk about the sorption of these compounds. So we have um, Ottawa sand, Marden soil, which is a higher organic carbon soil, and Appling soil, which is also a high organic carbon soil. And what we do is we see how much is retained on the soil due to sorption. And you can see in this case on the left that the Ottawa sand has a very low sorption for PFOS, whereas we, as the higher organic carbon and the higher surface area soils have a much larger retention for PFOS. The other thing to note here is that the curves that we get, we can fit a nonlinear Freundlich isotherm to these data that re represent the data very well. So um, I want to just say that we take this information and we can look at what's in the soil profile. So um, on the left, you see Ottawa, uh, Ottawa sand, and you can see the, the, the gray here is sorbed mass, the blue is air-water interfacial mass, 
and the orange is aqueous mass. And what you notice right away is the aqueous mass doesn't contain much of the PFAS, that it tends to be on the interface and or absorb to the Ottawa sand. And when you get to a higher surface area soil, a finer soil, you can see that we get a lot of retention at the interface. So um, if I was to take an aqueous sample from the pore space and I was to estimate the amount of mass from that aqueous sample, I would uh, tell you that it wasn't very contaminated. And that's because I missed all the mass that was at the interface and absorbed to the soil. So this is a very important conclusion of our work that's going to affect how we sample in the field. Now, I don't have time to go through and show you all the validation experiments that we ran, but I'll just show an example of a column experiment that was conducted, or actually two column experiments, with a mixture of two PFOS compounds and a mixture of six PFOS compounds. And, and what you see here are effluent data from packed columns where we were looking at um, absorption or uh, accumulation at the organic liquid water interface. And this was a chlorinated solvent entrapped in the soil column. It's a clean Ottawa sand, so there's not much absorption to the soil itself. And what you see here is the solid line represents the model simulations and the symbols represent the data. And what I want to just show you is that the um, model can capture the behavior that we see very well. The other thing to note here is that some of these compounds elute from the column very rapidly, whereas others like PFOS take much longer to elute. And that's again, because they're, they're accumulating at the interface with the, uh, at the non-aqueous non phase liquid interface. And you can see here that PFNA also is retained a fair amount. So our model is behaving very well. It's capturing the the behavior that we see in the column experiments, it gives us some confidence that we have some predictive capability. So um, in summary, I wanted to just show you the equations that we use to model. We have a flow equation, which is the Richards equation, which is standard for unsaturated flow modeling. We have a transport equation, which has the traditional absorption term and, and uh, advection and dispersion terms and accumulation term, but we have an additional term now that accounts for the interfacial accumulation at the air-water interface. Um, we have to model the interfacial area. So we use uh, estimates based on capillary pressure curves. This is an area of active investigation right now. And we use the extended langmuir Zizoskowski isotherm, which includes competition of the PFAS for the interface, excuse me. Um, and we also use sorption isotherms for, um, to represent the sorption to the soil. And we're using a nonlinear isotherm there as well. So I wanna show you a few example simulations that we did at the field scale. Here we looked across the country at representative Air Force bases that were doing fire training, and there is a there are lots of them. What we wanted to do was find sites that represented different hydrogeologic environments, different um, climate cl had climate uh, different climate information, and different sorts of fire training. And that, what we did was we looked at all the literature, excuse me, all the data on the fire training, and looked at how often they did, tr did training, what kind of volumes they released, etc. We also looked at core data from the sites so we could get information on the soil profiles. And we rolled all of that up into a matrix of scenarios that we were simulating. So I'm just gonna be able to show you a few of these to highlight some of the interesting things we're finding from these simulations. Um, I also, we have to um, release a mixture. AFFF is a very complex mixture. It's very proprietary, so we don't even know all the constituents in it. But we're going to use, um, it, for this example, I'm going to use PFOS, which tends to accumulate uh, strongly at the interface, PFOA, which accumulates less strongly, and a, a hydrocarbon surfactant, which can lower the interfacial tension a lot and compete for this interfacial um, accumulation sites. Um, we also uh, developed, based on the literature, we went to the literature, we found um, all the absorption information we could find for these compounds, and we developed a regression equation to estimate the um, isotherm parameters from such available data like percentage of silt, percentage of organic carbon, and pH, because we don't have the actual absorption information from any of these sites. 
We got, um, we used the web soil survey to get near surface soils and we had the bor boring data. And we also looked at daily precipitation and evapotranspiration data that we were able to get. And we modeled a period of 30 to 40 years using these data. So here's an example. This is Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Um, this is a um, highly transmissive glacial outwash surficial aquifer. And uh, we looked at various types of fire training that went on, sessions that went on there. Um, they typically would use 25 to 100 gallons um, and they would conduct these fire trainings about four times a year. They diluted the concentrate to about three to 6%. Um, we also looked at examples where they had a crash and they they came and they flushed the crash site with this AFFF. So it's a one-time flushing of a, a larger uh, volume of this 3% dilute solution. And we also looked at an example where you just released the concentrate because of a spill. So um, I wanna show you just an example of the sorts of simulations you can get with our model. This is a 25 gallon AFFF concentrate diluted spill. It, this is over a period of uh, 10 years and this fire training occurred four times a year. And what you see on the left here is the, um, the profile at various times from one year to 30 years. This is a 30 year profile, the red dotted line. And you can see that this is PFOA moving through the soil profile. The horizontal line is the water table. And you can look at when this um, PFOA reaches the water table, that's the blue line in the lower left. And you can see that it reaches the water table at about, starts to reach it there about five years or so, whereas the PFOS has held up in the soil profile a great deal longer because it's held at the air water interface. And it doesn't reach the water table um, until about um, 24 years into the into the simulation. And you can see that the even though the the um, breakthrough at the water table is very smooth, the actual fluxes at the water table vary a great deal because of the rainfall events. And here what we find is most of the PFOA was retained by soil absorption and most of the PFOS was retained at the air water interface in this profile. We can also look at the effect of spill, um, conditions. And what we found was the cumulative volume of the, concentr of the um, concentrate or the diluted solution was what was important, not the, not the size of the um, spill at any given time. And this is what this, this plot shows. Um, we, we have a parameter we call the um, spilled concentrate volumes SV here. And you can see that for different spills with, with similar SVs, you get different behavior. But that's if you have a concentrated spill where you have a very high concentration of these PFOS, it actually arrives sooner than it, it would if it was periodic. And that's because of that nonlinearity that we saw. We reach a limit to how much can accumulate on the interface. And when you have high concentrations, it moves more rapidly through the profile. So all of these these simulations give us a feel for how the spill volume and the spill conditions affect things. Also, it's interesting to note that if you if you do uh, you sort of magnify the uh, period, let's say over a five year period, and you look at the the accumulation at the air water interface, what you find is that the ratio of the interfacial mass to the absorbed mass fluctuates, and it fluctuates with rainfall events. As the soil gets moister, the interfacial area decreases. And what we see is that the uh, mass goes to the absorb phase, and then it goes back again as the interfacial area increase again, increases again. And this was kind of, um, it's in, not intuitive, but now we understand it. And we, we can now go to the field and maybe look for these kinds of fluctuations. But again, the aqueous mass actually tends to be very less, very much less important at many, at this site in particular. Now, if we move to a more moist environment, very shallow water table, sandy aquifer, this is in Florida, what we see is a different behavior. And not surprisingly, what we see is that the mass reaches the water table much more rapidly. There's much more absorption. And because the moisture content is high, there's much more interfacial accumulation. And so we see very rapid breakthrough and particularly with these like the concentrated spill or the one-time spill, they can just travel very quickly to the water table. 
So we see a very different effect in a very different in, in a different climate and under different hydrogeologic conditions. And then the final example I wanted to show you is a semi-arid continental region where we have a finer, more absorptive clay material it, and um, still a shallow water table. But what we found here is that the transport to the water table was extremely slow. And in fact, we saw no breakthrough of PFOS in 40 years of simulations. So all of this mass is held up in the soil. And here, the interfacial mass is much less important than the absorbed mass. So we've seen that the hydrologic conditions and the climatic conditions greatly influence how the mass will be distributed. And there's not one, one general rule of thumb that you can make for how important these different compartments are. So I want to end with some key points. Um, first of all, I hope I've convinced you that the interfacial accumulation of these PFAS compounds is important and um, that they can retain mass at within the soil profile for many, many years. Um, they can be modeled by nonlinear functions of concentration and we can successfully do that. And um, that the importance of absorption versus interfacial accumulation is gonna depend upon a lot of things like moisture content, the soil characteristics and the concentration of PFAS. At the field scale, this accumulation is gonna significantly retard some of these chemicals, some of them will move rapidly, some of them will be retarded. And, and so you're going to have a lot of moist, a lot of mass accumulation above the water table that's going to remain a source of contamination for many, many years. And um, the different hydrologic conditions, the different soil properties will affect how much mass is retained and how, how, how to handle this, this type of contamination. And remember, if we're we're going to start regulating to parts per trillion, we're going to have to find ways to handle these contaminants. So we're looking forward to trying to figure out ways that we can, if we can't excavate everything, what can we do to keep them from migrating further down into the water table? And um, so with that, I will conclude my talk. And again, I wanna thank you for your attention and uh, feel free to email me at linda underscore abriola at brown.edu.